Hello, everyone. Hello. Dear Professor Rogers, dear CDPTO Youth Group members, dear ladies and gentlemen from the public watching us from the SP webpage, I'd like to welcome you to the first fireside chat we're organizing during the Science and Technology Conference 2021. In particular, I'd like to also thank you, Professor Rogers, for your commitment and willingness to take part in this chat, although the time difference with you being in Australia should be overwhelming. <laughs> I'd like to welcome also Mr. Ronan Lebrun that will join this, that has joined this chat. He is a geophysicist and software engineer that contributes daily to keeping the state of art system of the CDBT verification regime going. Also, Ms. Zainab Azim, that is an inspirational speaker and mentor who is dedicated to empower young women to pursue STEM fields and space exploration. She'll have an interesting dialogue with my colleague Sneha right after mine. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker for today, Professor Tracy Rogers. She's an Australian ecologist, researcher, an international speaker who studies how mammals survive changing environment. In her current role, she is a professor at the Evolution and Ecology Research Center at University of New South Wales, Sydney, where she has worked since 2008. She is an advocate for advancing women in science and encouraging youth engagement and interest in ecology. In Professor Rogers' tenure as an academic, she has supervised 42 research students to the successful comp completion of their degrees. She is also an active. She is also an active participant in the Australian Scientists in Schools program and has run workshops for children at the Powerhouse Museum, Taronga Conservation Society Australia, and the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. Considering your background, it is my pleasure to have this dialogue with you. There has been quite a lot of interest from the CTBTO Youth Group members, and they have sent me some questions that I'll share with you. Nevertheless, to everyone watching us now, please continue to send your messages on the chat if you have more questions, or on the live stage three chat, and we'll pick some of them in the end. To continue, Professor Rogers, tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to become a marine ecologist. Um, well, good morning, everyone. It's two o'clock in the morning here. Um, <laughs> so if I'm not completely uh, cognizant, it, I've had a cup of coffee to, to get me going. Um, I became a marine biologist because I grew up by the sea. And from the age of a, a tiny little thing, I used to collect little blue ringed octopus, these really poisonous um, creatures we have here. And as an eight year old, I'd had a tank full of them. Um, and uh, I took them to a professor at, at, at the local university and he was developing the anti venine and that's what I wanted to become. I want to become uh, a, you know, finding these bioactive compounds in these really poisonous animals to cure cancer. And I ended up studying with this professor when I was at uni and it was um, injecting a lot of mice and watching how long they took to die. So I was left going, oh gosh, what am I going to do? And the thing that I was really good at was maths and physics. And so I found myself in sound and marine mammals and, and a range of different things and, and modeling basically. So, um, and um, it, it's really nice to hear that Zena was it, that you're really into STEM, that one of the things I'm most proud of in my career is of those many research students that I've had, most of them are actually women and they've gone on to become um, academics and researchers and uh, uh, so that's actually one of my my proudest achievements, I think. Wonderful. You have an incredible career, Professor, and I believe here that I'm speaking on behalf of everyone watching us right now. Um, could you share with us three main highlights from your work? Um, so um, three main highlights. Um, well, um, Difficult two o'clock in the morning. Um, I should have prepared. <laughs> um, so the kind of work I do, because what we're doing is we're looking at how animals respond to change. The work evolves over time. So the kind of work that I've been doing 
the work I started with from my own PhD was working in Antarctica with pack ice seals. And so we've been looking at uh, over the last 200 years, how changes in the ice regime has impacted the seals. And for me, why that's actually been a, 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 something that's really um, important and special to me is some of the areas I went to when I was, I was a PhD student, when I visited them later, those areas that were all ice cliffs are now rocky outcrops. So I've seen in my lifetime, those habitats completely change. And to go back and find out more about what happened with the, the seals through time, we've used museum collection samples to actually look at the isotopes in, in seals back in the past through to now. And so that's really connected me with chasing down and finding where different explorers went and where their collections went. So that was, was, was very exciting. So we've actually have seen this real change in the, in the seals, the Antarctic pack ice seals through time. And I think another, another um, component of the work that I'm, I'm really excited about is the work with the, 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 the whales that we're doing now. And why I ask for Professor Lebois to be here, hope I pronounced your name correctly, <laughs> um, is part of his work was why we decided um, to look at the, um, the, 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 the whale population that we've just found now. now we're like big system people looking at changes through time. So we've been using the CTPT data to look at whale movements and movements between areas to see how, um, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, you're seeing really big changes in the, the water temperature. You're getting this tropicalization, warm waters moving further south. And so we were really interested to see how that's impacting whale populations. and. In biology, finding large term data sets on any animals, let alone mammals, let alone the largest animal that ever lived, is really difficult. Governments don't like to do long term monitoring, it's really expensive. So the CTBT data is perfect as it's got this beautiful long term signal and from lots of different places. So the, the one that we've been looking at in the middle of the Indian Ocean we can see the animals or pick up animals moving from one side of the, the archipelago to the other. And um, Professor Lebois' work said potentially a blue whale. Now, we were looking at other blue whale groups there. There's Antarctic blue whales, There's a number of different blue whale groups there. And this one that's potentially another blue whale, um, other people were saying, oh, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Amora's whale because they have a very similar kind of um, song pattern. But the very, very loud source levels that that um, that that uh, were shown sit nicely with other blue whales. And we looked at all the different kinds of mammals and the way that we sort of looked at their sounds and their patterns of their sounds, they also look like just like a blue whale. And Amora's whales are all different in different areas. So depending on the area that they have very different geographic variation. So we went and got different data sets from all across the Indian Ocean, and we found that um, Professor Lebois' whales are actually what we're calling the Chagos whales are actually moving between Sri Lanka over to Australia and back to the Indian Ocean. And at the moment, we're now looking at the oceanographic drivers when they when they switch and move between the different um, components of the archipelago. So that's two. But I think um, another really quick one which has nothing to do with sound. And it's one of my students that just was really quirky and it was really cool. The other thing we're really interested in is this, okay, you've got ecosystems changing and animals responding to those changes. But one of those big changes to it, like a human, human activity. And the, the um, in, in Africa that, uh, um, and we were working in Botswana specifically, that a big problem for wildlife is the interaction between humans and, if um, uh, one of my students worked with elephant, one with lion, and that trying to look at methods that are actually really sustainable and cheap that, that help people and animals live together. And one of my students, Cam, came up with this crazy idea that if you, you know how butterflies have um, eye spots on them and that it's actually an anti predator strategy. So we painted, or he painted, I didn't, I just took, you know, get to say that I'm involved, but he did all the hard work, painted eye spots on the bottoms of, of cattle 
and other cattle with none. And over three years, those those lions were the, those cattle weren't predated upon, whereas other cattle in the group were. So it's actually worked really nicely. So now the the local um, herders are using that technique to actually protect their most important cattle. So they've got the sacrificial cattle, and then the the ones that, that are the important one. So that's that's probably three enough. It's wonderful, <laughs> and that's wonderful. So. Um... And I know that this is actually, this SMT is not the first one that you have attended, as you have attended also in 2017, right? And of course, I would like to highlight in particular your latest study uh, and finding of this new group of whales uh, in the Indian Ocean, and you just described it. But have you worked before in any other research that the CDBTO data helped you and that CDBTO data helped you? Yes, yeah, so the, with the CTBT um, data, we found not only that group of whales in the middle of the, um, the Indian Ocean, we found another group of blue whales up in the Amman Sea that they visit that same site and they move up. So if that's the Indian Ocean, here's my slide, my lounge room. Um, the, 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 the group we've just found now move this way through the Indian Ocean, and then there's another group that go up into the Amman Sea. And, um, we're looking at uh, across the um, all the, the the Indian, the Pacific, and the Atlantic, combining the CTBT data with other kinds of data, and looking at oceanic drivers and when animals turn up and when they don't. And big ocean system drivers, particularly in the in the Pacific, that we we have this the ENSO. So the ENSO cycle to Australians is everyone knows what it is. We even Talk about when on in the in the breakfast in the morning when they're talking about the weather, they also give you what's happening with the, the La Nina or El, El Nino cycle. But anyone else in the world goes, what are you talking about? Because it drives our farming and all sorts of things. And in the Indian Ocean, there's the Indian Ocean Diapole. So what, what we've been looking at is um, finding uh, that, that with La Nina, which is when we get floods um, and uh, um, South America gets drought, we have a lot more whales turning up and we've used the CTBT data to, to look at that. And so my lovely student Gary is just um, publishing that at the at the moment. It's so good to hear. So indeed, uh, CTBT data was initially meant to be used to detect nuclear tests. However, we find it used now in so many other spheres from disaster reduction to studying climate change and, and so on, as you mentioned. Uh, to conclude, what would be your advice for young people that wish to pursue a career as marine ecologists? Um, my, my advice would be, um, and, and I, I, I talk to students quite a bit about this because I go to open day at the university and I get to talk to people students and their parents and the, their parents want them to study accounting or something else and the student wants to study marine biology and the same was for me I was told don't study marine biology do medicine or accounting or something but follow your passion um, that that marine biology and ecology in general is incredibly um, fascinating but also important particularly in the world that we live in now and that there are jobs for ecologists and marine biologists that we know so little about the ocean and particularly if you love maths and you love love coding and those kinds of things and you um stuck in your room playing computer games you're perfect for for coming and becoming an ecologist <laughs> because what we do is we love we love our maths um so yeah it's it's and it's it's a rewarding uh, an incredibly rewarding career I, i've worked all over the world Antarctica from Antarctica to the to the tropics um, so it's um and but mostly staring at a computer and code but but that's okay thank you thank you Tracy um, as I mentioned earlier we have with us today also Lisa Rona Lebra that has been involved in so many research during his career and has made a tremendous contribution to his scientific work in 2016. Uh, Mr. Lebra published a paper where he highlighted the possibility that sounds recorded over several days in 2003 may have been blue whales. 
So, Giron, and perhaps we can start with you shortly telling us a bit more about your position as a CDPTO staff member. And we'd love to know more about your paper you published in 2016 and other cases that the CDPTO data has been used for scientific study. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a great, uh, great topic. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to meet uh, uh, Professor Rogers and, and all of you. Um, so, my current position is in the office of the director of the IDC as a fusion and review officer. And I also take care of the group of analysts. Uh, uh, as you know, review the automatic uh, results uh, that are produced from the IMS data. So, they review what's called a cell three, which is an automatic uh, bulletin that's purely uh, built up by a machine. And then the, 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 the final result of their review is uh, what becomes the review of the event bullet, which is the main product of, on the waveform side of, of the IGC. And that's distributed to the member states. Um, the other part of the, of, the, of the section of the group does the uh, radionuclide view. Uh, so it's the same process. You have an automatic processing of the spectra. Um, two kinds of spectra, as you probably know, and uh, and and that that becomes a reviewed uh, reports. Uh, so to to go more uh, into the uh, the topic of the of the talk, I prepared a few slides, so I, I will share them. So. Um, My, my background, as you mentioned before, is uh, is a geophysicist. Uh, I actually started my my career in the old business because that, at the time that was where the uh, most of geophysicists uh, actually found jobs or started their career or had an old career. I do not advise people to do this these days, but there are still some interesting things to be done there. Um, I became involved in, in monitoring uh, in uh, 1994, uh, so that's a long time ago already. And the first thing that I did was develop what's called the automatic association process. So that's the process within the chain of processing uh, at the IDC that uh, puts together the detections from various stations and builds a bulletin. Um, this is a purely automatic thing and uh, it's not perfect and we've been working for many years uh, even before 94 of course uh, they, they were they were ancestors to the uh, system that we're currently using um, and uh, so so that's what I've done between 94 and, and still joining the, the CTBTO for the first time in 2000 uh, starting in 2000 Nine, uh, we approached the machine learning community uh, to see whether there would be some improvements we could uh, bring to our uh, system. And, um, and then we came to the conclusion, yes, indeed there is. And so we are currently using a software which is uh, based on the Bayesian, on the Bayesian method. And as Sir Rogers mentioned, of mathematics, uh, that's something that also drove me initially. Uh, I was very much uh, motivated by, by uh, mathematics when uh, so university. Um, and uh, so that process started in 2009, and it's, it's currently a piece of software that is used complementary to the uh, legacy software, which uh, I contributed to building. And we have established now it's complicated when you have a something which, which is operational which has to run every day 24 hours a day to switch all of a sudden to a new system so what we have done is put in parallel the, the what we call the legacy system the old system if you will and this new system is running in parallel and whatever the old system doesn't do well as well as a new system the analysts have access to so the analysts have access to the part of the new system, whether advanced that are built by the new system, that were missed by the old. So that's currently where we stand, and we are hoping that 
uh, in a year or so, we will have a complete switch to the new system. And, and I'm certain that at that point, uh, to have a long uh, introduction to my, my background, that's really my bread and butter, if you will. That's what I do for, for a living, have been doing for a living. The second series of uh, contract with CTBTO now, and that's where it will be. Um, <clears throat> so when I left uh, CTBTO the first time in 2012, I was motivated by machine learning. And then I read a paper, uh, I think it was by Flor Samaran, who is also a very well-known uh, whale uh, specialist. And the question was asked, well, I wonder if we could tell in individual whales just as we could recognize individual human beings from their voices. So that was a starting point of, of my research. Uh, plus the fact that I had become familiar with the uh, hydroacoustic data from uh, CTBTO and, and a very detailed, long propagation waves uh, that, that you, can, you can look at in, in the data. And so I, I took advantage of a little bit of free time actually that I had after working from uh, for CTBTO to to look into that. And uh, after doing a bit of reading, I really became fascinated by the world of whales, and in particular blue whales. Um, and as Professor Rogers mentioned, um, even if blue whales are the same uh, species, Balaenoptera musculus, uh, all over the the world oceans. Uh, they, they have sort of like, as far as I understand, I'm not a whale specialist, so uh, I hope that Professor Rogers will correct me, but it's sort of like tribes. They, they have a language, a specific language, with which they communicate with each other. That's what I got from reading papers from uh, Professor Hildebrand, for instance, at, at Scripps, and, and Daniel Harris at the University of Bergen. Um, I got to meet those people actually when, when uh, back in 2011 or so, and and maybe I was a bit inspired by uh, my younger son's drawing. He's, he's turning 26 today, so I'm, I was uh, I wanted to mention that as well. So this is what. Um, and so I became interested in in in. Uh, trying to find out whether we could recognize individual whales. And so I looked at uh, some data. I, I think the very first day I looked at was, uh, you know, I picked, okay, January 1st, 2003. Uh, and um, and, and there they, they were signals there that uh, were very intriguing when I put them through, through a sound uh, rendering software. It did sound like they, they were, not uh, mechanical, they, they sounded biological. So I did a bit of study and then I developed some method and software to process those signals. And the idea was to, to look at the direction where they, they originate from and the approximate uh, distance. Where they so very briefly, uh, this is on the, on the left side, this is what's called a spectrogram. So you have time, x-axis and frequency on the on the y-axis, and this is this is a signal um, that was visible uh, at data day of 2003. And uh, <clears throat> then I did a, a bit of research, and and there was actually one uh, paper that that uh, mentioned this type of signal, which is reproduced here, part, and and they mentioned it was recorded only recorded at the CTBTO stations, and they called it type nine. And assumed it was blue whale, but um, biologists are careful not to attribute um, name, let's say, or, or a particular species to a sound unless there is visual information of it. So uh, that, that was the starting point. Uh, and so I developed methods to look at the direction and very briefly here um, on the lower right, it's a map of uh, station H08N in the uh, Chagos uh, archipelago. So that 
a triplet of uh, hydrophones, as you probably know, the, the in water stations for hydro acoustic, uh, for the hydro acoustic network, have three um, hydrophones for them triplets, and they're about two kilometers on the side. So the triplet two kilometers on the side at the uh, so far channel depth, so it's about a thousand, roughly a thousand meters. And uh, since you have three hydrophones, you can actually figure out the direction from which the signal comes from. And so that's what's the, uh, the right side here. This is illustrated by the waveform. And then uh, something called, uh, it's a processing method that's called STLTA, which we actually use in seismic as well to do the uh, preliminary detection of uh, signal on, on the waveforms. And it's also used in the hydroacoustic system. So I reproduced that, um, and uh, and then from from the uh, delay, from the, if you can see here the, the green the green signal at uh, N two, which is this hydrophone here, uh, color coded in green, comes in first, and then you have N one, and then you have N three. Traces are so doing a bit of processing, uh, you can figure out the direction, and this is indicated. So this is the direction where this, this signal is coming from. So uh, assuming that this is a whale signal, then it's the whale is somewhere to the northeast of this. So, um, and the other thing that uh, is needed since the signal is only seen at one triplet, then it's the, the I was wondering whether maybe the distance could help. And, and this is illustrated here. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> As the signal propagates, uh, the uh, level of, of energy uh, recorded, of course, decreases. And this is basically what the left side here is being trading. And, uh, and then you can come up with a very rough estimate of where the signal is coming from if you, if you use the direction and the distance. And, and so this is graphic paper uh, published. And by the way, I'm very, I'm, I'm uh, very humble that it, it was a turning point for you, uh, Professor Peters. Uh, and uh, and then uh, you can basically tell that the whale is somewhere. It's not very precise because you only must originate from somewhere. And uh, and I need a bit more work on this. Um, and I want to also acknowledge my co-authors, Heidi, Heidi Kuzma, uh, Victor Suchik, and, and Professor Bockelman from the University of Vienna. Uh, who, uh, I had the pleasure to, uh, to work a little bit with them, both Victor and, and, and Goetz, uh, and uh, in those years and I, before I rejoined the CPDTO. And then um, I did a bit more work on this and if you remember, the original idea was, uh, can we tell um, one whale from the other from the sound that they make? And so to do that, you need to establish that you are looking at different whales. And uh, looking at a bit more detail, this is from January 22, 2003. Um, th those signals, the two first signals are likely to come from one whale, and the third one is coming from a, from a different whale. It's, it's coming at a very different angle. And uh, the times the time span between those two signals makes it makes it impossible that the same whale would swim from the place to the other at a short time. So, so this is my last slide, and I just want to kind of close the loop and say, well, uh, and, and I haven't worked more on this. So this is this is up for for the someone is is uh, in design in data processing and mathematics and coding. Um, in, in the youth group, you know, go ahead and look at the data and, and, and let's, uh, let's see if we can actually uh, solve this, uh, this question. Can we, can we tell which whale this is coming from? Can we tell one whale from another? Wonderful. My conclusion. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We are, we are amazed, especially with the drawing of the whale on one of the presentations. <laughs> Uh, I believe that I speak for everyone here when I say that every info information we receive today is extremely valuable. As I can see the timing, we do not have much time, although I would love to continue with this conversation. And because I need to leave 
uh, the floor to my colleague Sneha uh, for a dialogue with Ms. Azim. However, we can give the opportunity to one or two questions that members have, maybe only one of them. There is a question from Virginia Bertuzzi. Uh, what kind of impact has climate change on blue whales? Tracy, you're muted, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so where we're actually really interested in looking at blue whales as a signal for climate change, because you, you um, the way they feed is energetically really, really expensive. I'm trying to be really quick here. Um, and uh, they do this thing called lunge feeding. So they swim fast and when they open their mouth, it's like a parachute underwater. So it slows them to a stop. So it costs them huge amounts of energy. And so they swim past um, swarms of food when it's at low densities. Now with changes with climate change, warming water has changed the amount of phytoplankton. It's in some areas, it's decreased phytoplankton and, and in, um, and also change the composition of the kind of plankton there. So it's completely changed the, the food right at the base of the food chain. Basically, the grass of the sea has completely changed in areas. So that's why we think that the largest animal in the world, the blue whales, will be a fantastic long-term signal to see what's happening in these warming oceans because they need to time and get to these places with these really high-density blooms to be energetically efficient. And so far, we are seeing in different years when you have different oceanic drivers that there is a change in the um, when the animals turn up. So we're starting to see an oceanic signal as well. Now, with maths, you need long, lots of data if you're you know at least three or four times your cycles. Now, these oceanic cycles are like four, four, five years long, um, and they're actually concatenating. They're becoming shorter. Um, these La Nina events are actually happening every three or four years, which is good for us for the data set, bad for the world. Um, but yes, yeah, so that so the whales are actually uh, um, a, a, a really good sentinel to help us see what happens into the future. And the continuing standardised data collection with CTBT allows us to actually get these really, really longer and longer and continuing data sets that makes it incredibly valuable, not only for whales, but sea noise, um, rain noise, a whole stack of different things, which will tell us lots about climate change. And sorry, that was a bit too long, so I'll shush now. That was amazing, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Tris. Uh, so I hope this di uh, dialogue, although very short, has helped uh, CYG members understand better the use of CDBTO data also for scientific and civil applications, uh, helping in this way, pushing forward not only the disarmament agenda, but also the sustainable development goals. So thank you again. I'll leave the floor now to my colleague Sneha. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sneha. I work with Marius on the CTBT Youth Group Task Force. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Zainab Azim, our next fireside chat speaker. Uh, Marius introduced Zainab a little bit at the start, so she is a Canadian university student, inspirational speaker, mentor, and future astronaut. So definitely a very, very cool person for us to have along with our other excellent company. And she works to empower young women to pursue STEM and space exploration. She's an activist who advocates for equal opportunities and access to education for girls and women around the world. And she's the co-founder for the Global Initiative Envisioned for Education. She provides access to quality education, especially focusing on STEM. And she is a future, she's the youngest future astronaut to fly with Virgin Galactic. I believe hoping to take off sometime next year, but I'll let her talk more about that. Um, she's working to fulfill her dream of exploring space and inspiring other young women to do the same. And she is a UN Office for Outer Space Affairs Space for Women mentor which she uses as a platform to inspire and mobilize the global community, I think, starting with us. Uh, so Zainab, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And may I just say, what an act to follow up. I have high bar set um, after Ms. Uh, Rogers, Professor Rogers and Professor Brass. So really excited to be here. Well, uh, to start off, Zainab, I want to ask you, what drew you to space as a discipline? Great question. Um, well, I would say it started with, um, it's not 
wholly exciting. But as a kid, instead of reading bedtime stories before um, I went to bed, my dad would make me watch The Cosmos by Carl Sagan. So that was my first exposure to it. Um, and I credit that uh, to sparking my, my curiosity around the subject. Beyond that, though, it was more so mundane things like just paying attention, mostly just paying attention to the world around me um, and whether it was looking at the night sky or sort of questioning a lot of, you know, what is this? What is that? What are those little lights in the sky when I fall asleep and I see? And that awareness of the world around me also made me more aware of the world within me and the connectedness of ourselves to the universe. Um, and I, I think it was just something about space that gave me a different perspective um, on the world and humanity and the oneness of of everything because you know while the world especially now we see a lot of conflict and borders um you don't see that when you're in space and so i think it was it was just it it was emotional it was intellectual and it was also a spiritual thing that drew me to this discipline that is an incredibly beautiful explanation um and one that i think will really resonate with a lot of young people who are interested in space exploration uh, to change the subject a little bit, um, a lot of your work does have to deal with accessibility issues with for women in STEM. And I'm curious if you could talk about how these particular accessibility issues affect women interested in space exploration and space as a discipline. Yeah. Well, first, acknowledging the fact that it impacts different women differently. It's not every woman's experience is not the same. I uh, I'm a visibly Muslim woman, but I'm also privileged in the sense that I live in Canada and also that economically I'm privileged. I don't have to worry about sort of paying university fees or so on and so forth. Um, that is not the case for everybody. So the first thing is accessibility, right? Not every girl or adult woman has access to education. There are about 125 million girls around, uh, around the world or 44% of adolescent girls in the poorest countries. They don't have access to basic education and you need education in order to be able to do STEM or really any other field. So that's a huge issue. But the second part is not only access to education, but the current education that we do have. Uh, a lot of sort of the projects, um, and and I, I give credit that people are trying to provide education um, in areas that need it. But the problem is, is that they're so culturally disconnected. Um, they're trying to apply sort of a, a North American or a Western model to another country where different issues exist um, that they know nothing about. And without, in, you know, without talking to community members about what are the needs that that your community needs and how can we overcome them? Um, so the quality of the education is 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 lacking. Um, but even in the develop what you would call the developed world, um, even there, there's an issue with retaining women in STEM. There's the issue of the STEM pipeline. It's throughout whether it's in their education careers or when they get into the field, we see women dropping out at higher rates than men. Um, and so we, you know. We have to research, and, and there has been research, but we need to do more research on sort of what why that's happening. There have been papers published and 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 uh, people who have spoken on the fact about the biases that women face um, within education and within academia. I'll give you just one example. There was a Microsoft study that was done um, in in schools, and they found that uh, when the names were removed from a test that was it was standardized test, um, and they were graded that women actually scored higher than men, but when the names were put ba back on the standardized test and they gave it to a different set of teachers to mark, they were marked lower. And women of color were marked lower who had ethnically sort of different names that were not, to be blunt, white people names. So, you know, we see these biases manifesting within education. I I mean, Professor Rogers can probably speak better too. I'm not in, I'm not there yet in my life, but in in the field itself. Um, so the the second issue is retaining retaining women when they do decide to pursue this field. Um, and it's not always in even if, for instance, you don't take on the bias of the outside world and you don't let what other people think affect you. These biases are very easily internalized. Um, I've w noticed it with myself. I'm sure any woman can can speak to this. Even if you don't notice that you have them, you might 
you know, think less of your abilities or think less of your worth um, or, or less of your uh, your right to take up space in a place because you are a woman, but you might not think that's why you think that. I, I've been recently noticing that with myself. So it, it's multiple things, but, um, you know, it, it's a big topic to cover and I don't, I, I want to leave some time for questions because I'm sure there's more for the other speakers as well. Uh, but accessibility and retention are probably the biggest ways that this affects women. I, I think you bring up some really excellent points and ones that I think resonate with people who have been through the academic system, especially women of color. Um, and one sort of touching on your earlier point about subconscious biases, can you talk a little bit about how you see them reflected in contemporary space programs, both in for publicly funded ones as well as more commercial opportunities? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's easy to see on the surface level if you look at any, we'll start with the commercial one, look at any board, look at any team. I'm speaking about, I'm, I'm with Virgin Galactic, but I look at theirs and it's mostly white men. Um, and it not men outnumber women substantially. Um, even if there are the women that are there, they are mostly white women as well. Um, so if you want to look at it that way, when you look at space crews, when you look at astronauts, um, I would like to acknowledge the fact that we have made progress um, in acknowledging and giving credit to the women who have made space flight possible. Um, when you think about hidden figures, I don't know if you've seen that film, but you know that's one example. Um, but also in terms of more female astronauts, which is wonderful, but still men outnumber women um, when it's, the case is not that less women are applying. That's not what's happening. So uh, that's one way that it's reflected. I will give a quick story. Um, it would, I found interesting, uh, it's a little silly, but how this is also reflected in space programs is there was a NASA uh, spacewalk that was supposed to happen that was all female. And they had to cancel it because what happened was somebody assumed that there, there were going to be more men than women. Maybe that assumption was right because that's what it has always happened. There weren't enough spacesuits designed for women. So they had to replace one of the women with a man, um, which goes to show how the world or, you know, STEM has largely been engineered by and designed for men. So <laughs> if, that's just one example of how these biases can be, that was a bias that he had, that that, that team had for some reason. Um, and we see that reflected uh, in, in that story. And, and I would kind of, I don't, I don't like to generalize, but that can be sort of a, an analogy for most of the space sector. That's a incredibly good. That's an incredibly good point, and I think a story that a lot of us have did hear about, and I believe last year. And I think that you bring up some really interesting points about how women are not necessarily given the space within these STEM fields to be able to carve out a, a space, I, which I'm going to keep repeating, apparently. Uh, to prog to progress themselves in, in that way that we need to see. So can you talk to me a little bit about how we can go about trying to create that space for women within this field and within STEM generally? Yeah, well, this is the thing about diversity is you can hire more women and that's a great thing and we see that happening. Um, so I'll acknowledge that, prog uh, that progress. At the same time, it's not just about increasing diversity and getting more women. It's about when they are there, how are they being treated? I think it was Angela Davis. She gave a, a quote. It was um, in reference to something. It wasn't about women's issues, but it was diversity is a corporate strategy. It is not a synonym for justice. Right. And so when women are in those spaces, when young women or people of color are in those spaces and you hire them, are they being paid the same? Are they? being promoted the same and being measured in their, you know, their achievements or whatever, giving credit in the same way that men are. Um, and one of the ways that this can be done, it, it requires actual work. It can't, you can't just sort of talk about it. Um, there are companies that have been set up just for this purpose of training staff, of training board members, executives, whatever it may be, not only in their hiring practices, but doing an audit of their practices in the companies themselves or in the governmental organizations themselves to see are they 
is there bias there? Have they been biased against women? Um, and so sometimes the, the findings are surprising to them. Um, but if, when we talk about how do we sort of change visibility, it's not just about let's hire more women, but let's let's treat them equally and treat them equitably. Um, and that requires investment and sometimes paying for an audit or, or you know, transparency. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those insights, Zainab. I think talking about how you can actually about, prove that you value women by backing it up is something that is a very concrete step that can be taken and one that's helpful to have voiced. Um, I think another question I'd love to hear your input on is how is in some of your conversations uh, that you've given, even including yesterday, um, we talk about how COVID has exacerbated exacerbated some of the gender and race disparities in STEM education and sort of made those underlying biases and inequalities much more apparent. Um, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, this, I would say, well, it doesn't just apply to STEM, um, but I would say education in general. When we look at what COVID has done in certain regions of the world, women were taken out of schools uh, and because of the COVID situation, either they have to go and work and create income for their families, or, and to be blank, and you can look at the statistics from UNICEF, um, have, you know, getting pregnant. And so having to stay home and take care of the kids um, while the man goes out and, and, and works and brings income home. So they don't, they're unable to go back to school in that situation. And so we're yesterday I mentioned I think it was 23.8 million additional kids um, will not be able to go back to school and receive an education this year because of the pandemic. A majority of those are girls. Um, and it, that doesn't even cover that's not even the full you know breadth of it. That's only part of it. Uh, so that's one way in, in which COVID has really impacted it in, in, in different regions is the fact that uh, women are not after the pandemic going to be able to return unless unless there's an investment and, and we're able to support them in, in going back when they don't have the support from families. Um, I, I I think it's a little different in uh, Canada where I am and how that's affected women. I think uh, hopefully my hope is, is that they have continued can continue to have access to that education online. Um, but I think we're also, I, it, it, might, it might've been for the better because people have been waking up to the issues that they face. Um, I have noticed an increase in these types of conversations at conferences, um, which is, I think, a progress maybe, perhaps. So we're talking about it more. So maybe that that's the only silver, silver lining is that we're becoming more aware of our societal issues because we are at home and we are taking that time to reflect. Um, so COVID you know, has horrible implications for education in, in specifically developing regions. Um, but also, I think, is an opportunity to reflect, and we should not, I think, you know, there's, the, don't waste the opportunity of a crisis. Is, I think there's that, there's that quote. So I think we have an opportunity here to change things because people's mindsets are also shifting. Thank you, Zainab. I think you put that in, in a way that is very accessible to all of us and in a way that really reflects the current situation. Um, this actually feels like a good point to bring in one of the questions that we have from the live stream. Uh, which is from Virginia, who is asking, um, how can education serve the cause of peace? And do you sort of see a connection between these two things? Yeah. Uh, it's a great, great question. Uh, well, I, like I said yesterday, education is, is an enabling right. And so it is without education, you can't, it's very difficult to have and provide for the other human rights, such as peace. Um, and so, I would say when it comes to um, access to to education um, and, and quality education, that it absolutely has a role in, in serving and in creating peace. Uh, how that happens is, I guess, the question, uh, because we've seen some very educated people not do very peaceful things and start wars. So, you know, it's not wholly that, okay, let's just send everybody to school and then there's going to be peace. It's also the type of education that we have. And I think, you know, when we create such things that are ego based and sort of competitive instead of collaborative and seeing us working together instead of against each other, like your 
sort of the ranking system and grades, like my rank depends on you being lower than me. Uh, I'm, that's not contributing to war. That's not what I'm saying or peace at all. I'm just say, generally speaking, um, it, how we teach, what we teach, and and you know the the things that we prioritize in the in our education systems, uh, I think can sort of contribute to our ideas of peace and how we achieve that. Uh, that's a very philosophical conversation that I would love to have with you later. I don't know that I can answer it at once, but there's definitely a connection between the two for sure. Thank you, Zainab. Um, sort of as a slight pivot uh, in, in theme, but still sort of relating to education. Um, when you say, I, you touched on it a little bit earlier about uh, the biases in STEM that affect women of color in particular, that you have faced some unique ones of your own. Would you be willing to share some of those experiences? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll be honest. I've been again extremely privileged. I went to an all girls school <laughs> since grade six, so I have been exposed to a lot of um, strong women mentors and peers and friends. And so I didn't have a lot of uh, opportunities to internalize those biases that were being inflicted. But I you still face them because you're still in the world, even though I went to an all girls school the world is not all girls and so uh it was mostly for me it was internalized it wasn't someone telling me something that i couldn't do something i mean the comments sometimes on when i would do a conference and afterwards the videos they post those comments where you could see the bias there but i would say that most of my biases were internalized from what i would see even when i watch carl sagan's the cosmos when i would read books when i would see space flights or missions or people that I idolized these were mostly men in the field and so i did not believe growing up that i belonged or that i could ever do this i didn't think i could ever i wouldn't think i would be ever be here talking to you about this so it was more a self-belief issue be from these biases because of what i was being taught in school i learned about einstein and galileo never about any woman um let alone a woman of color and so what you know those were probably the biases that i internalized and i it's a work in progress to stop internalizing because even when i am at these conferences i question you know should i be here <laughs> you know is it do i am i allowed to take up the space basically and so that that's my own experience and i'm sure many many women have experienced it too well uh, i think that we can say with a lot of confidence that we're incredibly grateful that you have taken that space and that you, especially that you chose to share your experiences and your insights uh, with, with us because we think that there are incredible learning opportunities for all of us to find ways to make the world and specifically STEM and space travel much more inclusive. So thank you. Uh, on that note, I think I'll sort of begin our closing remarks and leave some space at the end for our wonderful uh, fireside chat speakers to give their final comments. But we just wanted to say a big thank you to both Tracy Zainab and Ronan for joining us. We think that having these opportunities to share knowledge and to be able to speak with experts and get this interactive experience for both the young people to contribute questions and pick people that they want to talk about and have them put on the stage, as well as you guys being able to share your own insights is incredibly valuable and goes a long way in making space for young people to be able to build the future that they want to see. So thank you. Thank you all of you for contributing to that. And um, I think if you don't mind, Tracy, we'll let you start with your closing remarks. And is it okay if I, I touch on a tiny bit of what Zenith was talking about? Is um, unconscious bias is what you were talking about, that kind of you know, imposter syndrome, um, feeling like I'm not good enough. And I've seen so many women do that and we shouldn't do that. And it's good to hear that you're stamping it down. And I think I, as a scientist and as a person, have been extremely fortunate that I grew up with a fantastic dad. And my dad had, and my mum, no expectations upon me. I worked in Antarctica to start off. 200 men, three women. I was treated like rubbish. But I didn't care because I sort of knew that what it, they had such low expectations. Just do whatever makes you feel good. 
and the I would there were two women in maths and I was in maths and physics there were two girls class full of boys the teacher was horrible but again my dad you love maths just keep to who cares what they think and incredibly low expectations just enjoy what you do and I think it was a gift because for all those negative Nancy's you get there's always that glimmer that lovely professor here and this one there and and those female and male role models helping helping us through and yet yeah, that 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 imposter syndrome we have to kill it that we've got a, enough against us already that we need to be our own champions um and i was just so 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 fortunate to have like you know thanks dad um have have like that a, a male role model in my right from my very very early on to just go oh just ignore it all it's all just crap um and uh so yeah like i was told so like to my face women only work on penguins you can't work on mammals um what are you doing on this show i can't believe you got the grant to be on this ship you shouldn't be you're wasting space you should not be here and you're stuck with them for the next six months on a, a little teeny station um and it was so awful it was fantastic because it just made me go well fuck you um and so yeah I, i'll hand a little bit of my dad over to over to you um that that yeah kill that kill that internal dialogue it's a it's a it's a it's bad it's a killer chuck it out <laughs> that's me so bad stuff chuck it out and gravitate towards the those good glimmer people because there's a whole stack of them out there both female and male and go searching for them that they they exist and in this in this you know awful world there's lots of awful ones but there's also some really there's some really great eggs of which you clearly are so and i'm sure lots of people are going to gravitate towards you so thank you for the invitation to to speak and it's been really fascinating and and, and really nice to meet everyone thank you tracy those are wonderful closing remarks from you um roman if you'd like to say a couple of words yeah, just a few words. Um, thank you uh, for the invitation again. I, I had fun preparing this actually. And um, yeah, I mean, this uh, issue of women in, in the workplace and, and uh, taking position of uh, responsibility uh, in the world is, is something that, you know, maybe I want to be a bit optimistic here. When, when I was in engineering school in, in, in France, uh, that's a long time ago now. I, <laughs> Feel just as young, but it's a long time ago. Uh, there were uh, there were three women on the class in a class of eighty. Um, when my daughter, who happens to be a, a physical oceanographer as well, uh, when she went to grad school, uh, I believe that there were more women than than men. So um, there is a trend, um, and uh, <clears throat> And I think that the parents, uh, you know, dad and 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 and, and mothers are, are important, of course, in the family. It's extremely important. That uh, young ladies know that uh, there is no there is no difference in their ability. They definitely uh, intellectual abilities, and physical abilities as well. Um, that's that's an important factor. The family is extremely important. So. Um, yeah, I'm rejoining uh, Professor Rogers in that. That's 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 quite thank you, Rogers. As Zina was saying as well. So I just want to uh, show an optimistic. Uh, thank you so much. It, it's really wonderful to hear you say that and to talk a little bit about the progress that we have seen. Uh, and to close, the lovely Zina, if you'd like to take the floor. Sure, I will. I'll try to make it quick because I know we're out of time. Um, well, I would just say that I completely re relate with Professor Rogers' remarks. I, without my my dad, I, I don't think I would be where I am. And my mom too, uh, having a strong female figure. She was a, a doctor, um, uh, and she left her home country to come here to give us a better life, and still got, redid it and became a doctor again. Um, she's no longer one, but you know, uh, it, it family is a huge part. Uh, and while the world is can be an ugly place when they throw you know vitriol at you, and I'm really sorry to hear that those things were said um to you it, it, yeah it doesn't affect you unless you internalize it unless you actually believe that about yourself and a lot of that comes from how how you grew up for the women though who 
don't have such support structures because there are many who don't. There are other women out there. You know, the UNOSA Space for Women Network program was created out of this is that there are other women. If you're if your family, if you don't have a family that's as supportive, you know, re and if you do too, you can still reach out to other women because they're, you know, that that's what when you are empowered, you empower other people. Um, I will, I just want to end on a on two notes of action, you know, individually when it comes to by the, so there's system also where as humans, we're the ones who hold them. So we do have a responsibility, each of us, whether we're women who've internalized it about ourselves or men who perpetuate those ones, uh, that we become aware of them and that we do something about them. So in the chat, I am putting a link. Um, you know, I I don't uh, sort of oh, tr trust all tests. And so I wouldn't trust this completely, but it is helpful in sort of noticing the bias, whether it's race or gender. Um, and then I would, after you figure out what your biases are, I recommend reading this book. It's called Deep Diversity, and it gives actionable items on how we as individuals in communities and organizations can overcome those biases. Uh, and the final thing that I would say is that, uh, yeah, while many things are systemic issues, um, Still, we can all do something in, in our communities. Your family is a community. If you go to school, that's a community. Clubs, organizations, those are all communities that you're a part of, and you're a part of a bunch of different ones. Um, so, you know, if you are in a position that you're thinking about, oh, I see this issue in my own community, what can I do about it? There's always, always something that you can do. And I'll give an example. I have a friend who, let's say he's on a track and field team. He noticed. There, you know, this is a very homogenous group of people and looking into where that issue comes from is the fact that sports require a lot of money, a lot of time that you could be spending working to get income. And so it was an, an income issue, frankly. And so he's working to create a scholarship with his team and fundraise for that so that they can increase accessibility to sports at their school. It's something small. It's not a huge systemic thing, but it is something. It is something. And so there is something that we can all do. You must pay attention. You must notice your own biases. You must ask yourself, okay, and when you get access to these spaces, create access for others and how you do that. Um, and so I'll end with a quote of, you know, I cannot do all the good the world needs, but the world needs all the good that I can do. So don't feel discouraged. Um, and and, and find other people, you know, it's hard to do things alone, find other like minded people who care about that um, and work with them and work together. And I, I think together is really the only way that we move forward and, and create these changes. So a, a bit of hope. Yeah, I would I would echo Mr. Grass's message of ending with optimism. Thank you, Zaina, for those remarks, as well as everyone else. Uh, it is absolutely wonderful to hear you all end on notes of hope and what action can be taken moving forward and what the next generations can hope to see. Uh, I think that's all from us at the CTBTO Youth Group Task Force. And we thank, thank you all again for joining us as participants, as speakers, and as people dedicated to trying to make the world a better place. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our future events, especially the ones happening this week. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye.